Um, thank you to Development and Company of Biologists for giving me this opportunity to present my work. Um, it's something that has been, um, I've been driving it for last five years or so, and I'm quite excited about where this is headed. But okay, let's start with uh, basics. I just want to share, uh, you know, where my passion in developmental biology lies, which is actually just microscopy and looking at uh, movies of developing embryos, movies like this. Um, and I guess it's a passion that we all share. We like to look at uh, movies of developing embryos, think about, you know, all sorts of processes that go on in, in the embryo and, um, you know, base our imagination of embryo based on uh, what we are seeing, right? Seeing is believing. Uh, at the same time, uh, what we need to keep in mind is that uh, embryo is in a context, right? It's inside, uh, it's surrounded by its environment. It's also protected from the environment, from you know uh, having you know various layers like this uh, around the embryo, which are protecting it. In case of fly embryo, the inner layer is called vitellin membrane, outer layer is called chorion, and uh, it's essentially like a physical and chemical barrier around the embryo, which is isolating its development from its environment. Right? Uh, it also takes a few things from an environment. For example, you know it can breathe through uh, these protective barriers, takes in oxygen takes in a bit of water uh, to maintain humidity and so on maybe also electrolytes small molecules what not, right and it, all of this is under the control of embryo what the embryo cannot control is for example temperature part of the environment right so that that is the basic motivation for my question how does temperature is affecting uh, embryo development and of course, I'm not the first person to ask this question. Uh, what people have done in the past, for example, is put embryos at different temperatures, and this they have seen that uh, as you uh, as the temperature increases, embryo development gets faster and faster. And this has been uh, seen multiple times. Uh, what we see is that this increase in speed of development is not indefinite. Uh, for Drosophila embryos, the sort of uh, ramping up happens till 28 degrees. And then afterwards, um, embryo development actually slows down. So this is kind of interesting, right? If we think of like Arrhenius equation or something, we should expect uh, embryo development to keep going faster and faster, but that doesn't happen. And so this there is this weird transition between 28 and 30 degrees where we think things are getting interesting. If we have embryos at temperature higher than that, these studies also notice that, you know, there are developmental defects. You don't get as many hatching embryos and so on. So there is something interesting happening at definitely at higher uh, temperatures, like 32 degrees. And again, people have done experiments, seen the defects at 32, but this transition between 28 and 30 or 29 degrees is something still a uh, bit of an open question. So that's what I want to ask. I want to ask what happens if we expose embryos to 29 degrees. And I'm, I want to say this as an elevated temperature and not a high temperature because higher temperature also it, it's been explored already to some extent. So to break this into more concrete questions, first thing I want to ask is, does the 29 degree exposure reduce developmental fidelity? So we ex do we, at 32 degrees, yes, we do, we do expect developmental defects, but does it already start at 29 or not? Uh, what sort of developmental defects uh, we are seeing and what is the mechanistic basis uh, for the defects that are uh, happening? And once we understand the mechanistic basis, then we can also maybe think about, you know, how to rescue these developmental defects. So let's start with the first question. Um, does elevated temperature reduce developmental fidelity? And basically what we are going to do is we'll, we are going to look at embryo lethality at uh, 29 degrees. So the way to do it is to expose embryos to 29 degrees at different, uh, during different um, phases of their development. Control, of, of course, for this would be just embryos at 25 because that's the culture temperature for fly, uh, for fly embryos and uh, fly flies in general. Uh, in co contrast to this, you can have 29 degrees exposure at the beginning or somewhere in the middle of embryo development. For um, following up on our uh, own interest, we are setting uh, these time windows. So if you look at gastrulation uh, initiation, then that happens at around three hours. So we are uh, picking these two three hour time windows uh, centered around gastrulation. And we are asking, okay, if we do these kind of temperature treatments, do we get larvae or not? What is the fraction of embryos that is making it? 
which what fraction of embryos dies. And what we can see is that uh, this middle one, exposing embryos to 29 degrees at the in the pre-gastrulation development has a significant um, problem, right? A lot of embryos are dying, around 15% embryos die um, uh, in this treatment. So, okay, so this is interesting. Um, what we wanted to then check is, okay, if that's the case, um, when exactly do embryos die? So we do the temperature exposure and then record embryos after. Normally at, in control embryos, uh, so now we are looking at a dorsal view of the embryo. We have the dorsal midline, right? Um, if you haven't seen Drosophila movies before, no problem. Just uh, keep in mind that I, I just want you to see the development, how it looks like um, in a normal embryo. Again, details are not important. What is important is that embryo is developing, right? You can see odd like different structures appearing over time, and then you know embryo does its thing. If I let the movie play, you will also see that um, you know the embryo actually hatches out, uh, like larva comes out of the uh, embryo. But so okay, let's look at this process at twenty nine degrees. So again, what we have done is we have exposed embryos to either twenty five or twenty nine degrees and then brought them back to 25 and then recorded the movie, right? So that way, the only difference between the top and bottom movie is the pre-exposure, not the recording temperature itself. And just to give you a comparison how of the orientation, the, we have con consistently marking the uh, dorsal midline, right? And we, we, in the previous movie, we saw movement of this tissue rudiment somewhere to the anterior you'll see that that process doesn't happen in the lower embryo. It happens like just for a second and then it just goes back, right? And so that these movements are related to gastrulation in Drosophila, which is indicating that, you know, gastrulation itself is failing in these embryos. At some point of time, even there are huge uh, defects happening in the head region and so on. Basically what I'm trying to say is that as soon as actual morphogenetic movement starts, embryo is going to experience problems. And we are seeing that the embryos are dying during gastrulation itself. Again, the fraction of embryos that is dying is also kind of uh, comparable to the lethality fraction that we saw earlier. So to answer my first question, is there a problem with developmental fidelity? Yes. We see that around 15 to 20% of embryos don't gastrulate. And obviously that's a problem, right? Um, Thinking of this, we wanted to go forward and ask, okay, what is the mechanis mechanistic basis for these developmental defects? And obvi obviously, since the e temperature exposure is happening during pre-gastrulation development, that's when we expect the defects to take place. So let's look at what happens in pre-gastrulation. Again, start, let's start with control embryos. Um, you're seeing nuclear divisions here. Again, I'm saying nuclear because these divi nuclei are dividing in a shared cytoplasm. Um, for the divisions to take place, again, this is more like a textbook knowledge uh, at this point. Uh, what is called as pseudo-cleavage furrows are forming around mitotic spindles, which help the chromosomes to segregate. And throughout all of these divisions, the nuclei are still anchored to the cortex. These are the nuclei that will then in get encapsulated to make cells, which will make the plastoderm epithelium, and then the gastrulation movements will start. Right? So... We are seeing this. I, the point is that the nuclei are, even though they are dividing and being so dynamic, they're still anchored um, to the cortex. And I'm saying this, obviously, it's sort of uh, preempting the fact that there is some problem with nuclear expulsion. Uh, when we put embryos at higher temperature, we see nuclear expulsion. And I'm just going to set up the slide to show you exactly what we are supposed to see. Uh, so the top movie is basically the same movie that we just saw now with the color code. What we have done is we have color coded the pixels which are close to the embryo surface in green and anything that is far from embryo surface is in magenta. So nuclei that are sitting on the embryo cortex will be uh, labeled in green and the ones that are expelled will be in magenta. You'll see that in the top embryos, there are not many embryos which are expelled, but in the bottom one, things are getting interesting and problematic. And I'll let it loop once again. 
as you can see here, there is a huge loss of nuclei, right? All these nuclei were supposed to be part of the blastoderm. Blastoderm is supposed to give rise to all the um, tissues in the developing embryo. And so if you lose nuclei like this, as we can imagine, we are going to lose um, developmental structures that, that are forming from that region, right? And that's not good for embryo development naturally. So what we are trying to say is that defects like these are something that are, we think that these are causal in terms of you know the developmental defects that we are seeing later on. Again, similar fraction of embryos is showing defects like this. And yeah, that again builds our uh, confidence, right? So here, uh, when we stare at movies like this, what we started seeing is that there, these are mitotic failures. And what's happening essentially is that if you look at a mitotic failure, we see chromosome segregation defects. After these defects, both of the nuclei that are um, coming out, so both sister nuclei are going to be lost. And what we are seeing is that at elevated temperature at 29 degrees, these kind of defects are happening more and more often, giving rise to holes in the blastoderm. So with that, again, answering the second question, what is the mechanistic basis? We think the mechanistic basis for these defects is mitotic failure, which leads to nuclear expulsion, which leads to blastoderm holes, which has which create gastrulation defects and embryos are dying. So in, in that sense, we kind of know what exactly is happening. What is the you know mechanistic basis? What is the mechanism? Why these, where the problem is coming from? And knowing that is really good because now we can do something about it, right? We, we can try to rescue these developmental defects. And so then we were thinking of what, where to look for candidate genes and so on. One of the places that we thought was quite interesting was uh, looking at natural populations themselves. Drosophila being um, cosmopolitan species is kind of good because we have all these populations of flies all over the world, which are adapted to their natural locations, uh, which means some of them are adapted to high temperature, some of them are low, adapted to low temperature and so on. And many studies have already looked at these kind of adaptations and picked out genes, which could be correlated with uh, this kind of adaptation. Uh, to temperature, right? And when we look at these genes, we asked, okay, which of these genes are somehow linked to, you know, spindle dynamics? So we see that there is a mitotic failure and so on. So th it has to be something to do with spindle dynamics, right? And we saw that there were three candidate genes, which were really promising. One of them is called Shaggy. Uh, for those who are uh, into mammalian development would know this as GSK3 beta. And again, going back to this image, what we know is that Shaggy is responsible for constituting a protein complex, which links actin and microtubules at, during this like chromosome segregation, right? So we thought, okay, it, this is nice. If that's the case, best thing would be to overexpress some of these components and ask if that is rescuing embryo lethality or not. So it's a bit of a jump. So we thought, okay, we can overexpress Shaggy, we can overexpress alpha catenin, and then ask, okay, if it's if that is rescuing embryo lethality or not. Again, similar experiment, 29 degrees exposure, letting embryos go ask, okay, larvae or not, control embryos, we see the 29 degrees is causing problem. But when we overexpress alpha catenin and shaggy, we see that this rescues the defect that we are seeing. So embryo lethality is rescued. I'm not showing the data, but also mitotic failures are rescued and so on, right? So that really, brings together everything for uh, from my perspective. So developmental fidelity is affected. We see that we can understand the mechanistic basis for what's going wrong. And at the same time, we can also rescue these defects. And uh, with that, I would like to close the presentation and acknowledge the people who have been involved. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Let's see, Thanks. do we have any questions? There are no questions yet. Oh, okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. uh, first question. Um, oh, we have a couple of questions. Okay, so we'll start with one from one of your fellow panelists, uh, Natasha. When the nuclei mm -hmm. fall out in your developing embryos, there seems to be a wave occurring through the embryo as opposed to complete mm -hmm. synchrony. Do you know yeah. anything about these waves and do they all look generally the same, like ending in the same part of the embryo? Yeah, so that's another. That's good. Uh, that's a good observation. Yes. So uh, again, th this is still like a small part of the whole story, right? The whole story is there. We have a preprint about this. 
uh, and we are there we are exploring it more but to just quickly answer the question yes there are these waves of nuclear divisions that we can see um let me see if i can go back to that slide yeah so we have these sort of waves which are crashing you know coming from the two poles and exactly the spot where they meet is the place where you see loss loss of nuclei so this is something that we have also quantified nicely mm. there is actually another factor which is crowding of nuclei so if i maybe I pause the movie at the right place you can see that uh, or maybe at some place yeah oh uh, yeah nuclei are like yeah, really yeah. crowded yeah so both of those yeah. are somehow yeah responsible for this mitotic failures cool Okay, uh moving to Q&A questions. Um <clears throat> mm -hmm. do the nuclear expulsion events that you see happen at around the same time across the embryos, for example, during cycle 14? Yeah, yeah. So cycle okay. 14 for some reason is really uh so let me jump back to that. Yeah, cycle 14 is uh really special. I think at that stage the nuclear density is so high that mm. Nuclear that they're more vulnerable start. to it. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Hmm. Uh, in the movie you showed, it looked like the nuclei that were being internalized were all in the same region. Is this consistent? Is there something about this particular part of the embryo? So I think that's building on kind of, it shows this wave mm -hmm. in this one part. Is there something about that part? So that it's a good question. Yes. Um, what we are seeing is that this uh, region is somewhere in the middle of the embryo. It does. It's not closer to the poles, right? So that is the only sort of um, specificity that we can see. It, it's not. It's not like at. It's happening at you know exactly half, a fifty percent, sixty percent, seventy percent embryo length. Nothing like that. Somewhere in the middle, right? And um, interestingly, many times it's just on one side of the embryo. So this is something that we have seen with mm. fixed samples. So it's it looks like it's really just somehow self-organized. Yeah. Okay, last question for now. Are there conditions mm -hmm. where an embryo is exposed to 29 degrees in vivo? Um, if so, how could this possibly be applied? Uh -huh. um, I'm not sure. I mean, in lab conditions, for sure, we don't expose embryos to 29. Um, right. now, again, that, that was the point, right? In natural... Uh, systems like in natural populations obviously there are embryos which are at 29 or higher right. temperatures but they are adapted so yeah it's a bit tricky to answer have you that. looked at the different at the different species then the ones that are that normally live in this 29 degrees or that have that exposure do they still show this phenotype or not then are they resistant no. to yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So no, as in I haven't looked at these species, okay. but I don't expect them to see this, show this phenotype. Right. That could be interesting to look at to see how they've, how they avoid it, and that might be a way. Yeah. But the yeah. reason being is that this transition temperature is different for different species. Mm. So it's not about twenty nine. It's about when exactly yeah. this transition. It's about takes when place. they do it. Okay. Mm. Cool. Very interesting. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks.